We're standing in the Philippines on America's Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. It's about 8.51 in the morning on June 12, 1991. Blue sky, few clouds, not much wind, temperature about 76 degrees. It's really quite pleasant, but all is not well. Volcano scientists for many weeks now have been studying changes in earthquakes and ground deformation under Pinatubo Volcano, just 15 miles away from here. And just two days ago, they decided that a cataclysmic eruption might be possible soon, but they really couldn't be sure. But nevertheless, 12,000 people on this Air Force base were told they had to evacuate immediately. Standing here two days later, it's kind of weird in this recently made ghost town. Suddenly, the ground begins to shake. There's a huge explosion from the top of Mount Pinatubo. Smoke and ash rise out of Pinatubo for the next three days until there's one major cataclysmic eruption where three and a half cubic miles of rock and debris are thrown as much as 22 miles up into the stratosphere. Day turns to night. And when it clears, all that's left of the top of Mount Pinatubo is this crater. Eruptions of this type are not uncommon. This was a fairly large eruption. But there have been four in the last 8,000 years that were 10 times bigger. And there are many in the geologic record that were 100 times bigger. Now, these kind of eruptions in historic time have been observed to be followed by about three years of cooling, about one degree Fahrenheit. This is what happened with Mount Katmai in 1912, with Krakatoa in 1883, and with Tambura, a 10 times bigger eruption in 1815, followed by the year without summer in 1816. These type of eruptions, as I say, typically are followed by cooling, and they can be huge. They can also be followed by warming. In this case, a Pinatubo, in the January following the Pinatubo eruption in June, there was five and a half degrees warming in the Northern Hemisphere. What in the world is going on here? What would cause warming in an eruption system that's well understood to cause cooling over several years? It would be more than two decades before I could find an answer for that question. Now we're standing at Barthabunga Volcano in central Iceland. Barthabunga began erupting in August of 2014. And over six months period, it oozed black lava out over the land, covering an area of 33 square miles, about the size of Manhattan Island. This type of effusive eruption can extrude lava for months, years, and even tens of thousands of years. 250 million years ago, an eruption of this type extruded lava in Siberia, covering an area almost the size of the United States. Just imagine black basaltic lava extending all the way from New York City to San Francisco. The tropical oceans warmed over 14 degrees Fahrenheit as a result of that eruption, the long period of eruption. That's more than three times the warming of the oceans following the last ice age. It was lethally hot. 96% of all marine species went extinct. 70% of all land vertebrate went extinct. This was a major change in climate, and in fact, it was the biggest extinction uh, in the last billion years of, of geologic history that we know about. So we end up with two very different kinds of volcanoes. We have Mount Pinatubo that erupted in hours and led to global cooling for about three years. And we have Barthabunga that erupted for six months and led to global warming. And it's the interplay between these two that are so important. Now, I love volcanoes and I love to climb mountains. 
And here I am standing proudly on the summit of the first mountain I ever climbed at the age of nine. By the age of 19, I climbed my first active volcano as a field assistant to a world-famous volcanologist. I was hooked. So as soon as I could earn my PhD, I headed off for the US Geological Survey, where I spent 27 years studying volcanoes and other natural hazards. I was able to study volcanoes in Iceland, Alaska, Washington, California, Hawaii, and all the countries of Central America. It was a fascinating career. But after a very successful career and enjoying it a great deal, I decided I want to retire, relax, have a little fun, play more folk music, raft more rivers, and climb more mountains. But in 2006, I made a discovery that changed my life. And that's part of what I want to share with you today. When I was perusing the internet, I came across something really interesting. It was the Greenland Ice Sheet Program. This was a cooperative program of over three dozen Earth scientists. And they went to the summit of Greenland in the middle of the ice cap, and they drilled holes as deep as 9,000 feet down into the ice cap, looking at climate change over the last 100,000 years. They very carefully dated the depth of the drill core, mainly by adding the little annual layers in the ice. And they also studied the oxygen isotopes in the air bubbles in the ice. And it turns out this is a way of estimating the temperature of the climate at the time the ice was formed. Then they measured also sulfate, which comes from sulfur dioxide, which is emitted by volcanoes. So the amount of sulfate is related to the amount of volcanic activity. And looking out over the last 15,000 years, what they saw was this major peak in volcanic activity about 10,000 years ago. And if we add temperature to this in the black line, you can see that right around 10,000 years ago, there was a huge increase in volcanic activity, and it lasted for over 2,000 years. And by looking at the change in temperature, we can say that was long enough to cause warming to warm the ocean. Most of the heat content in the ocean atmosphere system is in the ocean. The ocean is the thermostat of climate. It takes a lot of energy to warm the ocean. If we look at the bowling warming that happened a few thousand years before that, we can see, yes, there was a lot of volcanism, and yes, it did last for a while. But it clearly wasn't enough to warm the ocean. And so the, we cooled back down into the Ice Age again. Now, if we look at this same kind of data over the last 110,000 years, what we discover is that there were 25 times at least when we suddenly warmed out of the Ice Age, within a few days or a uh, year or two in some cases, and certainly within a decade in all the cases. But then it took a century to a millennia or more to cool back down into the Ice Age again. Just imagine our ancestors dealing with this kind of climate change. It was only the crafty ones that survived. Now, I couldn't figure out what in the world was causing the warming. Until one day I found in a paper where they just casually said, you know, the ozone concentration was really low after Pinatubo. And as I started looking into this and looking for stations around the world that had recorded ozone, I discovered that in Arosa, Switzerland, were the first measurements in 1927. And then when you look at ozone at a given station, it changes every time you measure it, every few minutes, every few days. But when you average the recordings at a given station over some period of time, you begin to see some things very systematic. This is the Arosa data showing the annual average ozone. And what really stands out on this curve are the two red circles. Following the eruption of Pinatubo in 1991, the amount of ozone decreased a large amount in 1992 and even more in 1993. Pinatubo was the largest volcanic eruption since 1912, well off the side of this diagram above me. But then nine years later, there's almost a similar amount of ozone depletion following the eruption of AF Fjallraken in Iceland. Remember, that was the one that interrupted European airspace for many weeks. So we have this issue that explosive volcanoes seem to deplete the ozone layer. What is ozone? 
Well, ozone is a molecule that contains three atoms of oxygen. And what's important about ozone, is very different about all the other gases in the atmosphere, is that ozone is created and destroyed regularly. The average lifetime of a molecule of ozone is about eight days. It turns out that ultraviolet C, shown here as UVC, radiation is four times hotter, four times more energetic than visible light. And this is enough energy to split an oxygen molecule apart into two atoms of oxygen. These can then recombine with molecules of oxygen to form ozone again, O3. Then it turns out that ultraviolet B has enough energy, much less than ultraviolet C, but still more than visible light, to split the ozone molecule apart. And this cycle goes on and on and on all the time on the sunlit side of the Earth. And every time you split the oxygen apart or you split the ozone apart, you generate heat. And so the result is that the ozone layer, which is really just the physical part of the atmosphere that is most suitable for this cycle to go on, turns out being a blanket warming Earth. It's almost like an electric blanket because the energy is coming from the sun but it's helping keep Earth warm. And the problem comes that when you deplete the ozone layer for whatever reason, more ultraviolet B reaches Earth, and we can measure it coming to Earth. And we also know this because our risk of sunburn and skin cancer has increased since 1970 as we've depleted the ozone layer. And that's why it's much more important now to put on more suntan lotion and cover up when you're outside because this ultraviolet B radiation is not good for us. Now, it turns out in the 1960s, we started manufacturing large amounts of chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs. CFCs are very inert. They don't interact with much. And that's why they've been very useful as a spray can propellant, or as a refrigerant, like Freon, or as a solvent, and many other purposes. So these became very popular in the 60s. I think those of you that were around in 1970, you could buy almost anything in a spray can. But then we found that the temperature started rising. And this shows the average temperature from all the four major analyses of temperature. There's a strong agreement that starting around 1970, temperature started to rise. And you notice they're rising along with the chlorine that's available from the CFCs. And what scientists discovered in 1974 was that when these CFCs were taken way up into the stratosphere, and especially in the presence of polar stratospheric clouds, PSCs, that they were depleting the ozone layer. It only takes one atom of chlorine to destroy 100,000 molecules of ozone. So you don't need a lot of CFCs. Then in 1985, they discovered the Antarctic ozone hole, where ozone was depleted almost as much as 50% over Antarctica. And by that time, scientists began to think they really understood that it was CFCs that were the villain. They were the ones causing the depletion. So they convinced the United Nations to pass the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer, one of the most successful protocols in all United Nations history. Sure enough, in 1993, the increases in chlorine CFCs stopped. In 1995, the increases in ozone depletion stopped. In 1998, the increases in temperature stopped. If I'm right, man accidentally caused the warming that we had from 1970 to 1998, and man accidentally corrected the warming by passing the Montreal Protocol, trying to seal up the ozone hole in Antarctica. Since the greatest depletion was in the ozone hole, one might imagine then the greatest warming ought to be in the ozone hole. And sure enough, on the Antarctic Peninsula, there was warming of over 12 degrees Fahrenheit, the greatest warming observed anywhere in the world in the last 1,300 years. So if we return to Pinatubo again, an explosive volcano, what we see is that chlorine and bromine emitted by the volcano 
goes up into the atmosphere and depletes ozone, and this led to the winter warming right following the eruption. But in addition, sulfur dioxide and water vapor is exploded high up into the stratosphere. And right below the ozone layer, it forms an aerosol, a mist. And this traveled around the world within weeks. And over months, the molecules in the mist got bigger and bigger and bigger until they could reflect sunlight and disperse sunlight, causing the cooling. If we go back to Barthabunga, on the other hand, it's again bromine and chlorine emitted from the lava flows rising up into the atmosphere. But there was no aerosol formed. Very little material was exploded. Effusive volcanoes don't typically explode much. So this led to global warming. So we have on the one hand explosive volcanoes that happen within hours and they cause global cooling effusive volcanoes that can go on for months, years, thousands of years, and they cause global warming. And it's the balance between these two that changes climate. And we can see throughout the geologic record where this has happened many, many times. Effusive volcanoes are more common. Climate warms significantly. Explosive volcanoes are more common. We can cool off climate and even go into ice ages by a sequence of explosive events. So seeing this balance between the two gives us a very clear understanding not only of climate change throughout geologic time, but also climate change throughout our lifetime. For example, the Dust Bowl droughts of the early 1930s just happened to be exactly at the same time as a very rare sequence of eight volcanic eruptions, small volcanic eruptions, around the Pacific Ocean. Then in the 1960s, the increase in CFCs led to the warming, as I discussed. 1998, the Montreal Protocol turned off the warming. Then from 1998 to 2013, we had what most climatologists now call the global warming hiatus where there was very small changes in temperature. But in 2014, Barthabunga began to erupt, and 2015 is the hottest year on record since thermometers were invented. It's quite clear that volcanic activity has a major effect on climate. The possibility that this effect might be greater than the effect of greenhouse gases is something we all need to look into quickly because it's very important. Thank you.